Yeah, for those of those that are not back, uh, they'll hear our voices and uh, come in. So real quick, um, how many hours of sleep are recommended daily? Seven to eight. Seven to eight. Um, how many hours of walking weekly cuts heart attack risk in half? Five. It actually, in the nurses' health study, women who got three or more hours of walking weekly had less than half the risk. Uh, five is recommended, um, but the statistic study shows only three is uh, required to get it in half. Every hour of exercise increases your lifespan by two hours. two hours. And activity increases mortality rate two to three times. Yeah. You need to eat at least how many servings of whole grains daily? Three. At least three. Three. People with the best longevity have BMI less than 25. 25. People who eat. Actually, it said five, but nine is the right one. And actually, the answer that Don Hall puts here in the answer is people who ate eight or more servings. But that wasn't what was in the program, so I don't know how he came up with that. So, what is the single greatest cause of preventable death? Smoking. Alcohol is responsible for how many deaths annually? 100,000. A healthy lifestyle can add how many years to your life? 10 to 12. 10 or more. I have a, a, a study that I did showing that statistically and looking at the DNA structure and looking at everything about our lifestyle, we actually could commonly live over 100. In fact, you've probably heard the term blue zones. Blue zones are defined as concentrations of populations of people who live more than 100 years. It would not be uncommon within people who chose healthy lifestyles to have almost all of their population living over 100. That's how God created us. We could be this light on a hill. The world would be streaming to our doorsteps to identify how it is that we got and achieved this longevity. We did get in National Geographic, we got this little blip, we're one of five for what it's worth. Okay, I've just got to change to the next program. By the way, for those of you who would want to purchase this when you're going to be giving it, um, this is how it will boot up, and it ha I'm going to show you more of this later. But these are the PowerPoint presentations, and you'll notice that there's eight of them. And I'm just gonna, it's gonna wig out on me here. So we're gonna be talking about physical activity. If I can get the computer, it's, you can't hear it, but the DVD is firing up. There we go. Okay, how's everybody doing? We're gonna go a little faster. I was slow on that one intentionally. And you know, typically this program is designed as an hour delivery. But as mentioned before, I wouldn't recommend that because I don't know that you can keep a crowd and I'm not really sure I kept you for an hour. That was a very long period of time. Uh, I think in a, in a classroom setting, it would probably be typical that at about 45 minutes, if you look at brain activity, at about 45 minutes, students start shutting down and they stop listening. And so it's, it's very hard to, to extend more if you don't do something different without a little break. So we'll try to keep that in mind. We're gonna go a little faster through this because it's, it's more intuitive and we're gonna talk about becoming more physically active. Okay, the problem. It's estimated that 250,000 deaths per year or approximately 12% of the total are attributed to lack of physical activity. We're blurry. You're blurry? I don't know how to... Do you guys know how to adjust that? Okay, most people are sedentary. Nearly three out of every four adults get little or no exercise regularly. 75% of people don't get regular exercise. 75% of people don't get regular exercise. How many? 75% of people, that's huge. Now was that true 100 years ago? No, we were in an agrarian society. We didn't have so many automobiles. I mean, it wasn't intended 
that we would sit on our behinds all day long behind a computer screen doing nothing but watching little binary numbers come up on the screen. It's not how we were made. Only 23% of people get regular light to moderate activity. And only 12% get any regular vigorous activity. That's not going to be us, is it? And we're going to tell you why. Regular physical activity reduces your risk for all of these diseases. When it talks in the Bible, none of these diseases, well, my goodness, they were walking in the wilderness. They weren't taking this vehicle out here. They, weren't take, they didn't have golf carts. They were hoofing it. Physical activity level and the risk of heart attack. And this is from the Nurses Health Study. Again, look at the numbers. 72,000 women followed for eight years. A pretty good study. A pretty large number went for eight years. The risk of heart attack decreased with increasing levels. Heart attack risk dropped 54% in the most active women. Remember we told you there are going to be many things that we identify that will reduce your risk for heart disease in half. And here's another one. This is physical activity and cholesterol level. And this is in the low fit and the high fit. It just divided into those two broad categories. And this is all cause mortality in men. And looking at the cholesterol levels. Again, I, I, I kind of a no-brainer. This is physical activity and blood pressure. You have risk for hypertension. This is the low fit and this is the high fit. Not as big of a difference, but still a statistically significant difference. 19 years of follow-up, a big study, long number of years. Physical activity and smoking status. Again, everybody hits on smoking, and, and it's appropriate that people should hit on smoking, but let's not quit. This, again, is not a buffet. You didn't choose to quit smoking and then leave everything else at the buffet. Physical activity and longevity. Now, here's where it is. Here's where it shows that the risk for being low fit is worse for you than if you're a smoker. Now it's not huge, but it's statistically the most significant risk factor for longevity is being low fitness. It's worse for you than if you were a smoker or hypertension or high cholesterol or being obese or high glucose. Physical activity is the single most important predictor for longevity. That's what I said last time. I said if you don't get anything else, what's the most important predictor for longevity? Physical activity, exercise, fitness. More important than smoking. This is cardiorespiratory fitness and cancer prevention. Um, this is a study, this is a study of 25,000 people and this is the results. Um, followed for 10 years. High fit persons had a 55% lower cancer mortality rate than low fit persons. So you not only reduce your risk for heart disease in half, what do you do for your risk for cancer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cut it in half too. Mm -hmm. Physical activity and risk of hip fractures. Now that's odd. What would hip fractures have to do with this? Well, it turns out that your bones are not like this pole. Mm -hmm. Most people think that your hip is like this pole. You built it once, you put it in place, and you left it alone. Is that right? Your bones are living, effectively breathing, organs. And they get torn down and built back up based upon the stress that's placed upon them. Bones that are stressed more are stronger. And that's why when we talk about physical activity, we not only talk about getting aerobic activity, but we talk about some strength exercise, some, some weights, because we're stressing this bone, and we're going to make it stronger. It would be like if I beat on this pole, everybody looks up, they're going to fall. I'm going to be careful. If I beat on this pole, the pole is going to get stronger. How about that? Wouldn't that be a smart thing to do? That's how God made your hip. And that's why if you exercise, your risk for hip fracture will fall. Isn't that cool? Exercise and blood fat levels. Women who exercise by walking 90 minutes on a previous day had lower blood fat levels than those who didn't exercise. So if you don't typically walk three miles every morning, and you did this morning, your blood fat levels that we could test tomorrow would be lower. Yeah, that's pretty cool. 19% lower. 
physical activity and the risk of diabetes. And this is kind of, this is sedentary over here, and this is the most active. How much did it improve? Half. A lot of these things you'll find out. Single events will reduce your risk in half for multiple diseases, and then you start adding the halves, and you realize that the buffet is not the choice. Take everything that's at the table. Take a little of everything and be most healthy. This is physical activity and breast cancer. Women age 50 plus who consistently had high activity levels compared to those who were inactive had 67% less breast cancer. This is better than half. Are you getting the message? Moderate activity and health. These are the unfit and it says it's on, I just don't see it. Anyway, unfit. We're really having trouble with these today. Fortunately, I've got new batteries. So I'm going to have to change. Hold on a second. Actually, I'll just use this for the pointer and this for the cancer. So, we see the unfit, moderate activity and health. These are the unfit and these are the highly fit. A threefold difference in men. This is moderate activity and health in women. Look at this. The effect of exercise in health for women, it's greater for women than men. It goes from seven to almost 40, almost a sixfold. Almost a six-fold improvement. Physical activity guidelines. Every U.S. adult should accumulate 30 minutes or more. We read this last week. It wasn't last week. It was last hour. <laughs> Typically talk about weeks. But 30 minutes of more phys moderate, intense physical activity and most preferably all days of the week. The goal is to expend 200 plus calories. We actually, in our program, tell people to walk three miles a day, and, it's, it's, and that's, we're walking three miles a day. That would be the equivalent of 300 calories per day. So this is actually just two miles a day, and we actually recommend that people do three miles a day at least five days a week. Preferably six, but at least five days a week, three miles a day. The Institute of Medicine Fitness Guidelines to prevent weight gain and to gain optimal health benefits 60 minutes of daily moderate intense activity. This is greater than the two miles a day. If you're walking three to four miles an hour, you're gonna walk three to four miles in that 60 minutes. So brisk walking, four miles an hour when possible. And remember, that's why we talked about the, the three and the four miles per hour. If you're doing this three mile loop in under 45 minutes, you're doing four miles an hour. And that's our target goal. Your target goal is if you are at 54 minutes, this morning, your target goal by the end of some period of time, and you said it, is to try to get it down to 45 minutes because then you're walking four miles a day. We don't want your target to be 30 minutes or 22 minutes, although some people who can run, we really don't want you to go out there running as a general rule because you really increase your risk for a sport stress-related injury and then you'll have to stop exercising completely. We want you to get through the 17 weeks. And walking is a very beneficial exercise, in some ways preferable to jogging. Okay? So we want you in this period of time, and we know we had some runners, and that's okay, but at least for this program, I would highly encourage you to walk instead of run for several reasons. The health benefit's actually slightly better. You end up doing, instead of 22 minutes, you get 45 minutes of exercise. You're doing it at four miles a day, and you're also socializing, you're connecting, you're talking with people, and if you can still talk and still walk, your heart rate's at the right rate. Make sense? Physical activity is good medicine. All who can possibly do so ought to walk in the open air every day, summer and winter. A walk even in winter would be more beneficial to the health than all the medicine the doctors may prescribe. Do you believe that? I do, and as a physician. If you can get people to make proper health choices, that's more beneficial than all the medicines we could throw at them. It's huge. 
examples of physical activity. And we can go through these, but all of these aren't choices, so at least for us, but if you're doing this in a community setting, they may be going to the YMCA and swimming every morning. And so you need to know what, what, how that compares. This is moderate, three to four miles an hour, cycling at 10 miles an hour. I cycle a fair amount, and um, I typically, to me, um, if I'm doing t 10 miles an hour, I'm going crazy. Um, because 10 miles an hour is really, uh, you know, they say moderate, but if you're on a road bike and if you're doing anything less than about 18 miles an hour, um, there's, you know, you're holding the crowd up or something. But, so that's, that's actually very pragmatic and that's actually fairly slow. If you're on a mountain bike, you know, 10 miles an hour, just moderate exercise. Swimming at a moderate level, conditioning exercises, golf, I don't really, you know, encourage people to golf as an exercise, uh, but it is outdoors, um, and if you are pulling your clubs, um, you can do it. I could never, my brother's a golfer, he's a, like a scratch golfer, and that's probably why I don't, because I went golfing with him a couple times, and he was so much better than me that it was, and type You got a, more, you got more exercise. Though. Yeah, I got more exercise, because I chased the ball, exactly. The, the better you get, the worse level, you get less exercise. Um, but it's better than nothing. Um, but it shouldn't be your choice of exercise. You just shouldn't say, well, great, I've got, I can golf every day now because I'm supposed to exercise every day. <laughs> Canoeing, rowing, two to three miles a day. Actually, I, rowing is a very, very good exercise. How do you know when you're going two to three miles an hour rowing? Well, that's interesting. Th this is a really good question Don asked. How do you know if you're going two to three miles an hour? And the bottom, the right answer is it doesn't matter. And let me tell you why. Because if you're heading into a stiff wind, you're down on the Thomas Lake off of Hazel, out on the American River, and you're sitting there, you know, paddling away, and you've got a 15 mile hour headwind, and you're actually going backward, are you getting any exercise? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to know at what level your breathing is to know what level of exercise you should be doing. And that's why when we tell you, if you're talking with your companion, and you're occasionally out of breath, but you can carry on a conversation that you need to push it until you can just carry on a conversation. That's the appropriate amount of exercise. You don't have to learn how to take your pulse rate or do any of those things. And the same thing is true when you're rowing. You know, sing a song. If you can sing a song and row, you, you know, row, 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 I don't know, sing whatever you want, you know, you're going to be exercising at the right level. So don't worry about the speed or, or your pulse rate. Just worry about your, consider your breathing. And you'll notice as you become more acclimated, more fit, you're going to have to pick up the pace if you're, you know, to keep talking. And that's what we, we will expect and we want to see. Okay? And so you have some people who will come to your program and they're exercising and they, they have to walk about this speed if they're going to still talk because they start getting out of breath. And you have to realize that that's their exercise tolerance. And, and you can't make them do three miles an hour. They will die. <laughs> Okay? I'm serious. This is more vigorous. Walking briskly uphill. You'll notice coming uphill is a little different than going downhill. It's supposed to be. Cycling faster, 12 to 16 miles an hour. I was, um, my son-in-law um, bicycles competitively and I was drafting behind him and we went 12 miles once and our average speed was 23 miles an hour. Now, I could never have been out in front pulling, but I was just sucked in behind him drafting and was doing 23 miles an hour at, for 12 miles. I mean, that was a, it wasn't as good a workout as he got because, you know, he was breaking the wind and I was just, you know, sucking in behind him. But, you know, you can, you know, 12 to 16 miles an hour. Cycling fast or vigorous is closer to this number, not that number. But again, don't concern yourself with the speed. Consider yourself with your breathing. If you're breathing so hard, and when you, you have to stand up the bicycle because you're going up a hill, if you, if you turn to somebody and say, hi, 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 you're breathing, yes, that's a little too much. You need to back off a bit. Just can look at your breathing, and that's going to tell you your level of exercise tolerance. And that's pragmatic, and that's easy, and you don't have to teach people difficult things. Total activity time, it's not necessary to do all of your activity all at once. Isn't that good news? It doesn't matter if you do this in four blocks of 15 minutes apiece. It's about getting the activity. Now, there is one point that's important. 
especially if you're trying to get aerobic conditioning. Um, and and when, if you do your exercise all at once, you will actually burn a few more calories than if you break it up into four different aliquots. And you actually may burn more than a few more calories because what happens is, what happens when you came up the hill? What condition was your shirt in? It was wet. Okay, why was it wet? Because your body got hot. What happens your ba basic metabolic rate when your body gets hot? Your BMR goes up. You burn more calories because you're trying to cool yourself off. You're trying to preserve the body. So you're, you're kicking up the metabolism. So you're burning calories at a higher rate. So we look at calories burned for the three miles you walked. But while you were sitting here, and while you're still sitting here, you're still burning calories at a higher rate than if you wouldn't have walked. Right now, your basic metabolic rate is higher for those who walk than if you didn't walk. Isn't that good news? Mm -hmm. And that's why there is some benefit to getting all of your exercise. If you're trying to lose weight, for example, if that's one of your goals, it's a little better to get it in a block. But as far as the benefit for longevity, the benefit doesn't matter how many parts you break it up into. Does that make sense? You got that. Exercise intensity. You need to maintain your activity for the full time without undue stress or fatigue. Your activity should feel fairly easy to somewhat hard. Your activity should make you breathe deeply but not make you out of breath. A moderate sweat is a good indicator. This is walking pace and heart health, and this is 2 to 2.9. And the reason we talk about 3 miles, there's actually been a study looking at your heart health, and the study has shown that if you walk at least 3 miles per hour, the maximum benefit is achieved by that walking activity for your heart. And you notice this pace, which is a pace that people would typically walk if they're not really competitive. They would typically walk between 1.5 to 2.5 miles an hour and you're not getting as nearly the benefit as if you keep it above three miles an hour. And we're actually pushing you to four miles an hour instead of three. Um, so you have a margin and there's a slight benefit to four over three, but not like you see between these two. Progression. You start with modern activities and you gradually build up. And this is what you tell the community members, especially those people who are already out of shape. And you can assume that most people who come to the program are going to be out of shape. If they're really buff and they really know everything, they're not going to be so inclined to come to the program. Most adults do not need to see their physician before starting a moderate intense physical activity program. However, men older than 40 or women older than 50 who plan a vigorous program or anyone with either chronic disease or risk factors for chronic disease should consult his or her physician. That's just to protect you from all legalities. Um, we've done this program with hundreds of people and I am not aware of a health-related factor that, that occurred because of their entering a physical activity program because we're talking about walking. We're talking about telling them to talk and if they can't talk, if they're out of breath, to stop. You know, all those things are kind of safety valves for their health. Include strength and flexibility exercises two to three times a week. Um, these help protect against back pain and injuries and maintain bone mineral content, prevent loss of muscle mass, improve your figure and physique, and they prevent disability in older age. And we'll learn more about that in a subsequent program. Perform each exercise through a full range of motion. Weight should be lifted and lowered in a slow, controlled manner. No jerky things. Those things are the things that rip and tear tendons. You want a very smooth motion when you're doing weight training. Breathe normally. Don't hold your breath. This is musculoskeletal fitness and mortality. Um, a study of 3,933 men aged 20 to 69 followed for 13 years. Persons with low abdominal fitness, this is basically the abdominal fitness that you would get from, from sit-ups, and also um, grip strength, um, they're actually grip strength meters, you can test the grip strength, had significantly higher mortality rates. Um, this is the risk of low, and this is high for sit-ups, and this is grip strength. So this, this tells you your lower abdominal strength, and this is mortality. 
it, it just related the strength in lower abdomens and grip strength and then your risk of dying. And the risk is almost threefold in the low category for abdominal fitness and almost twofold, or 68, 67% higher in grip strength. Just your ability, and you'll notice that. This, this young 92 year old man came up and shook my hand, and this man's got grip strength. I, felt, I noticed that, and I noticed that when I shake hands. He has a very strong grip strength. And you look at him and you wouldn't guess that he's 92 years old. This is longevity, folks. <laughs> Strength test predicts functional limitations. How many years later? 25 years later. Look at this. A 25-year prospective study. Strength test was used. That strength test. Oh, that's all it was used. They measured strength test. The groups were divided into thirds based upon their strength test. And they measured it and followed these people for 25 years. Look at this. They determined the people who had the high strength, which is here, this is poor walking ability. And if you had low strength, you had a high incidence of low poor walking ability. Just based upon grip strength and then waiting 25 years and then determine what is their ability to walk. People who had high strength, this is their percent of limitation. Only 3% of those people had limitation if they had strong grip strength 25 years before. And if you had a poor grip strength, 12% of those people were having trouble walking. And difficulty rising from a chair, same sort of numbers. Strength predicts limitations in housework, walking, and lifting. If you don't want to be disabled, if you don't want to be in a nursing home, if you don't want someone taking care of you 25 years from now, you need to work on developing grip strength, lower abdominal strength, strength training exercises. Will reduce your, your disability 25 years from now. Strength predicts limitations in personal care tasks, being able to dress or bathe or toilet or eating. These are the basic activities of life. This is what defines us as human beings. And those activities can be taken away from us if we don't take care of our health now. If you wait until then, it's too late, folks. It's too late. You have to do it now. Low strength and relative risk of disability. Um, this, is, this is the relative risk. That's what that is. Um, this is the poor walking ability. And it basically says, you know, your ability to lift 10 pounds. A 10-pound sack of sugar. I bet you can lift a 10-pound package. You can. You can probably lift a 50-pound bag of flour. Your inability to rise from flour uh, of a chair goes up almost threefold. Just to do house cleaning. All of those basic activities of life are taken from you if you don't stay active and strong now. The bottom line, if you want to remain independent, it's vital to build and maintain good muscle strength now. Do the strength training exercises two to three times every week. Choose eight to 10 exercises of the major muscle groups and do eight to 10 repetitions of each exercise at near maximal effort. Be careful not to overstrain. These are interesting, these are case studies. This is Ben Levinson. At 103 years of age, he set a new world record in the shot put for men over 100 years of age. <laughs> to give you an idea, I can't remember how much the shot put weighs. I think it's about 15 pounds. And the old, the old record was actually 9 feet 3 inches. And he broke it by putting it over 10 feet. But I mean, he's 103 years old. He broke got the new world record. This is an amazing story. Mavis Lindgren, she lives up in Portland. I think, I don't know if she's still alive, but uh, I know that Don Hall, the originator, that actually ran in a number of marathons with this lady. She started running in her mid-60s because her, because her doctor told her to, because you, you're gonna have to get healthy if you wanna live. She's in her mid-60s, she's unhealthy, okay? She holds records for her age division in 11 Portland marathons. She's competed in the New York Marathon, the Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, and London in marathons, in full 
26.2 mile marathons. These are not 5K runs. Wow. And she started running at mid 60s. Her last marathon she ran, I think when she was 91. She ran 26 miles and she was a year younger than you young men. Look at this. Amy Mullins, I complained about bad feet until I met the person without feet. One of the marathons that Don Hall ran in, he, he had three women running with him, pretty much keeping up with him, passing him, and none of the three women had any feet or lower legs. And they were running a marathon. So what kind of excuse do you want to come up with with not exercising? Can we, can we find an excuse that will trump one of these? So, ease into and out of exercise, don't strain. Choose activities that use large muscles. Exercise daily when possible. Choose moderate activities to begin and increase your activity. Do strength and training exercise at least two to three times a week. Question, or oh, you're just stretching. Good, I thought you had a question. She's back there stretching. <laughs> I have a question. Most of the stuff that you talk about between men and women and I've noticed this all through school. Why do women live longer than men generally? Like, what is the real reason? Um, the question is, results? why do women live longer than men? Um, better results with all the physical exercise. Well, the women are catching up, by the way. As women and men choose the same lifestyle, the thing is, is um, men died from cigarette smoking because they smoked more, and so they had. And smoking was the was one of the major causes of, of longevity mm -hmm. reduction and many more men smoke than women. So for a period of time, that bubble, that, that many more men, it, it just drops the averages profoundly. You have these lifestyle choices which cause, because of their lifestyle choices, the men were dry, dying at a much younger age because there were more of them choosing the bad lifestyle. But women are now choosing a similar lifestyle because of equality. Yeah. So you get to be equal, guess what? <laughs> And as you choose the same lifestyle choices as men, you are going to have some of the same resultant impacts. Right. Dr. DeRose, do you have a comment on that? Well, I mean, it is what we call multifactorial. I mean, you mentioned one, but we'll talk about quite a few things in the class. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things. Um, there's co correlations between monthly blood loss and lower iron levels because of the high, you know, higher meat diets that we've culturally eaten. So women were somewhat protected because of uh, you know, the menstrual cycle. There's growing research about social health and altruism and nurturing and some of the things that we'll look at in the class that traditionally in our culture, women have been better at some of those things. Spirituality that we'll be studying often. I mean, who's, who's more often in church? So I mean, some of these things that we'll be looking at, so there's multiple factors and, I mean, you definitely, you know, hit on some of them, and I've touched on a few. Okay. Yeah. Well, as, you know, I, I had a professor in, in, uh, in residency who believed that the benefit that women achieved from reduction in heart disease during their menstrual cycle was because of the iron, it, the, the, your total iron binding capacity, the iron in your blood, is probably a, a risk factor for heart disease and the fact that you were losing blood. And he was actually doing a study looking at people who routinely, men who routinely donate blood to blood banks to, I, to track them. And it looked like he was finding a small but statistically significant reduction in heart disease based upon those people because they were losing blood. Right. Women lose it naturally as you were, and men were losing it unnaturally, but reducing their total iron in their blood. So as Dr. DeRose has mentioned, it's so many factors, but as women and men become equal in all areas, in their social life, in their, um, I, I saw a study recently, by the way, it was appalling. In Germany, there was a recent study that says that now more women are interested in watching pornography than men. Now, that's stunning. I don't even know if it's true or can be reproduced, but if that's true, that's terribly bothersome because women have been the mainstay of the family, of the social backbone of a society. And when women become equal in all ways as men, they get to share in all the diseases. 
So choose a variety of physical activities for you enjoy. Don't overdo it. Do activities with your spouse or friends. Keep a written record. This is a very good thing to do. Keep a log of, of what, how, many, how many miles you go in a day. Um, if you have a pedometer, there's, there's some studies that show that you should do 10,000 steps in a day. Now, unfortunately, some women, because of their, their, their walk, will, it won't pick up every single step. But, you know, a pedometer is a cool thing to have because it kind of gives you an indicator and you could track that also. So, quiz time. See, we got that through that pretty fast. We're almost back on time. So, true or false? 250,000 people die prematurely each year due to inactivity. That would be true. The risk of heart disease can be cut in half through regular activity. Half is a key, you know, whenever you see half, just say yes. You'll probably be right. Um, number three. Regular activity can cut the risk of heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, breast cancer, diabetes, and cirrhosis. True. It's a true story. Number five, obesity is a stronger predictor of mortality than low fitness level. That would be false. What is the most important? Did I miss four? Smokers who exercise regularly have a lower mortality rate than sedentary non-smokers. True. That is a true statement. For best health, you need how many minutes of moderate physical activity? 30 to 60. Yeah, preferably on the high side. We target for 45 minutes. That's doable. Um, but 30 to 60 is the right answer. Number seven, most people do not need to see their physician before starting a moderate intense physical activity program. That is a true story. For best health, strengthening and stretching exercise should be done how many times a week? Two to three. Two to three. And number eight, for best health, strength, oh, I'm sorry, number nine, the warm-up is more important than the cool down period of an exercise session. We didn't really go through that much. False, they're both equally um, important and probably not really important. Um, it turns out that people who stretch a, a lot, um, especially before exercise, probably have no greater reduction in injuries and may actually be doing themselves harm. Um, and Especially depending on how you stretch, um, you can actually overstretch, um, especially certain tendons, the big tendons like the Achilles tendon. And I've seen people, and I'm going to just, I'm not going to do this. I've seen people sitting out on a step and they're sitting there bouncing on their Achilles tendon. Yeah. That's a really, really bad thing to do. There's a high, high risk of tearing, especially when that tendon is cold. Um, it is probably a little bit more beneficial to stretch at the end when you're warm. It is good to stretch because you'll increase flexibility. Mm -hmm. But if you're stretching to reduce injury, um, that hasn't been statistically shown to be beneficial in, in a major way prior to exercise. What you need to do um, is you, you, you can kind of slowly get into it, kind of working things, you can kind of move things around. But people, you see some people just really, really, really stretching and they're cold. Mm -hmm. They're cold and that's not good for tendons. They don't like that. List two key principles in encouraging physical activity to be maintained for a lifetime. And I'll just read that. Choosing a variety of activities you enjoy, not overdoing it, exercising with a spouse or friend, social element helps maintain people maintain a physical fitness better than exercising alone. Choose a buddy, write it down, keep a log, do whatever you need. Get a pedometer, get a computer, get an iPhone app, you know, map my walk, you know, technology's cool, it just does amazing things. Questions? Any questions? I think we've covered most of the questions we've go, and that's okay. Typically, in a delivery session to the community, we specifically tell people to hold all their questions to the end because if you don't do that, you're not going to make it to the end. It's better just get it all because one person may ask eight questions and everybody else wants to keep going and you lose them. So keep going through it and just tell them ahead of time. If you have questions, we have this long period of questions. In fact, we tell them, write your question down, or you may not remember it. Go ahead and write it down. When we come to the question and answer period of time, you can ask your questions and we'll cover them. And that way you guarantee you get through the program, you deliver all the information, and you put all the questions where they belong. Okay? Another break. Yes, Don? Uh, you know, I noticed in these presentations that they typically, I don't know if this is right or not, but they might interest somebody who's like 40 and above. Maybe, maybe not. But there's not a lot of things like if I was 18, I'd just go. 
Wow. Although, I mean, I'm just wondering, uh, I'm just wondering if there's an approach to trying to grip that age group that you're working on. Well, the, the question is, is about age appropriateness of this material. When you're 50, this information is stunning because you start seeing the other side of the hill. And you're seeing, I, I need to make sure and be healthy. When you're 18, especially if you're male, you're indestructible, folks. You know, nothing you do will cause you any harm, and you're completely indestructible. And this information can be totally worthless to them because they don't get it. But what they do get is they do get dietary recommendations and eating healthy and approaching diet from a, a moral standpoint, from their moral compass, and, and from an ecological standpoint. Is it sustainable to have cows consuming corn and we're watering the corn and we're only getting 10% of the calorie return by eating the meat, or would it be better to carve the cow out of it and we could feed the whole world? Those kind of bits of information are profoundly engaging to an 18-year-old, and unfortunately, most 50-year-olds could care less about that information. They should, but it's generational. And so you have to deliver your message to the audience. You have to consider who you're talking to, and you will alter your delivery based upon who you're talking to. You have to know what you like at 92. What can I tell you at 92? Most people say, keep on going. Whatever you're doing, just keep doing it, you know, because you're 92, you've made it. But the studies have shown that if he has some significant, say, one health factor, you know, you look at George Burns. He smoked until he was at how old? I mean, you know, if he would have stopped smoking even at 90, he could have increased his lifespan. So there are things that even a 90-year-old can do that would actually increase his lifespan even more. So you have to you have to talk to your audience. You have to know what they're engaged in. And part of what we're going to do, Don, is what is an 18-year-old interested in, and what is a 50-year-old interested in, and what is a 90-year-old interested in. There's more endurance in old muscles than there is in young muscles. I can't explain it. He says there's more endurance in old muscles than there are in new muscles, and you can't explain it. Well, so there you have it. And it does, it does have to be age-appropriate. Um, but it's amazing. My kids, who are nine, they'll sit and listen to this, and they're, they can be fascinated by it. So just to think that an 18-year-old wouldn't be interested in this data is not true. Some of it is how you deliver it also. If you're excited, if you're passionate about it, I can tell you that eating worms is the most amazing thing you can ever put in your mouth, and I can be so passionate about it, you think, I might, I might try that. I, I don't know. <laughs> it depends on, you know, it depends on how you give the information. It's really, really important. Okay? Let's take another 10-minute break.